When the Lord opens up truth to us, when he gives us revelation, understandably for those who may need this, not in addition to Scripture, but rooted in the Word of God, when he opens up understanding to us, revelation, it's not because he's concerned about our intelligence. He's inviting us into an encounter. He, do, he doesn't show us stuff about himself so that we're smarter. He didn't, he didn't want Abraham to know he was the provider and then live without provision. Every revelation of God's nature is actually an invitation to a divine encounter because that's where we're transformed. Knowledge in itself doesn't transform us. In fact, knowledge puffs up. It's the encounter that keeps the revelation knowledge in check so that we become according to what the Word has said. It's the encounter with the Lord. You don't see Paul after his, you know, he's knocked off the donkey and uh, you, you don't see him strutting saying, wait till you see how many books I'm about to write. Uh, the encounter with the Lord seasoned him for the level of revelation that he had. Unfortunately, revelation is often pursued by us as believers without the encounter, which means it just equips us to be better debaters with people who disagree. It equips us for argument, not for transformation. To, to illustrate this, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, we have uh, Paul is talking to a group of believers who have come out of uh, the worship of many gods, and he starts teaching them about the gifts of the Spirit that all come from one God, m many manifestations of the same Spirit. And he gives them what I'm assuming up until that point was the ultimate revelation on the gifts of the Spirit, and remains so to this day in Scripture. But in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, he says, pursue earnestly spiritual gifts. In other words, if, if it came with the revelation, you wouldn't need chapter 14 to exhort you to go after what I just taught you. In other words, you have to pursue what you now understand. You will have to, in the quiet place, the secret place, get alone before God and pursue that mantle of breakthrough on your life. The Lord is wanting the Word to become flesh again. He's wanting it so that anywhere you slice us, so to speak, there is the manifestation of what God has actually said and who Jesus really is. He's wanting to reveal the wonderful Son of God again through yielded, surrendered people. And that's our great privilege in life. The kingdom of God is the answer to the cry of every human heart. Jesus is the king that everybody longs for. And you and I have the incredible privilege and honor to manifest who he is and what he is like to awaken in people the appetite that they were born with. Everybody wants a king like Jesus. Scripture says he's the cry of the nations. And so the kingdom of God comes to us in so many dimensions, in so many layers. And when the Lord first starts teaching every one of us about the reality of his world, let me describe kingdom first. Kingdom, king's domain. The realm of the king's dominion. It's not just where you're going when you die. It's a present reality every time the thief who kills, steals, destroy, death, loss, destruction, gets overcome by a kingdom solution, by God's answer, then the kingdom becomes manifest. I, I think I mentioned yesterday, Matthew uh, 12, 28, Jesus said, if I cast a demon out of you by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So what he's illustrating is every time there's deliverance, every time there's healing, the reason it happened is because the reality of another world took over. And you and I are the ones who broker that reality by brokering the incredible presence of the Holy Spirit. This is our great privilege in life, is to host Him and to release Him. He's the extravagant one. We just create room for Him to do what He does. And so this wonderful kingdom of God that we are supposed to seek first and foremost above everything else, that, that doesn't mean just the general approach to my life. It means when I find a person who is, I, maybe I have a neighbor that's in torment because of whatever, 
And uh, what does it mean to seek first the kingdom? It means that I'm, I'm going to contend for that person's deliverance, that they would be released from that torment. <clears throat> when somebody comes to me, whether I'm a pastor, a businessman, or whatever, and they say, I've just been diagnosed with cancer, what does it mean to seek first the kingdom? It means to seek the reality of a world that has no cancer, and for that reality to come crashing in for the inferior reality called disease and infirmity and sickness. Seek first the kingdom of God. It's what everybody longs for. And that kingdom, as the Lord uh, has already started for all of us, but when He starts to reveal the nature of that kingdom to us, He starts by teaching us the aspects of His world that are mirrored by earthly realities. Uh, for example, sowing and reaping. If you plant corn, you're going to have a harvest corn. And so he says, if you sow mercy, you're going to receive mercy. What is he doing? He's, he's illustrating the nature of his world that actually is mirrored in this world. But his desire is to build in us an understanding that starts to give us a perception of the nature of his world that has no earthly parallel. The reason is our great commission is to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I'll try to illustrate this in a minute. But the overall, uh, this is just my personal conviction. Take, take it or leave it. I'm just sharing uh, with you what I've been uh, pondering. The overall commission for my life is to pray that world into this one. Your kingdom, the realm of the king's domain, his dominion, your will be done, which is just a practical way of praying, your kingdom come, same thing, on earth as it is in heaven. And so he says in, um, in Matthew 16 and, and 18 both, he says, whatever you bind on earth, and, and I do believe strongly the more correct translation is whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So heaven is the model. It's how Jesus functioned. It's why he, he only said what he heard his father say. He only did what he saw his father do. He was a broker of another reality. People were living in the midst of the inferior. When he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he, of course, is referring to the tenderness of heart that sometimes brings us to an altar weeping, confessing sin, or whatever it might be. But it's more than tears. It's actually a change in the way we see, the way we think. When he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's basically saying, uh, I brought my world with me, and you're going to have to change your perspective on reality to see what is within reach that is in the invisible as it is right now. Change your perspective on reality. See, when Jesus had the loaves and fishes and he saw the multitude, he did not see lack because he saw he was living from a greater reality. See, faith lives from the unseen towards the visible. Faith sees. And so Jesus, in this wonderful commission, he says, he says, pray, your kingdom come. It's interesting, the first commission, the first thing we were commissioned to do was pray. I like John, John Wesley is, is quoted as saying that God does nothing in the affairs of man except in answer to prayer. It's amazing. He does nothing in the affairs of man except in, the answer, except in answer to prayer. If I own a home in uh, Dallas and you want to rent that home from me, even though I own the home and I have the master key to the home, I cannot enter the home unless you invite me because you're renting it from me. God owns this planet, but he gave the keys over to people. And he does not invade without invitation, but he's looking for the invitation. And so he says, pray like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
And the other commissions are all, to, in, in my way of thinking anyway, they are all subpoints of that one primary commission. Uh, for example, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, cleanse lepers. That, that is an expression of heaven on earth. We should be contending for cancer-free zones, areas in life on the planet where cancer cannot exist because of the glory. It doesn't come because we're brilliant and we have great strategies. It's, it comes because we've given place to the glorious one. Certain things do not exist. They cannot exist in that manifest presence of God. And what the Lord is wanting to do is to teach us how to, to honor and to give place to the person who would come and do as he pleases because he finds a willing vessel to take the risk to be silent or to speak, but just to host and to carry presence. So we have these commissions. We have the Great Commission, Matthew 28, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Disciple nations. I personally think that's actually a sub-point of this primary commission on earth as it is in heaven. Of course people would come to Christ if heaven invaded earth. There's something about the manifest presence of God. I, I, I don't know, that, I feel like there's tremendous reverence and value for the presence of God in this room. So let me say that first. But I feel like there's a measure of value for the glory we, we've not yet experienced or maybe only touched occasionally. Because in that glory, our performance becomes less and less important. We give place to, we cooperate, but uh, man, I, I look for those, I look for those times throughout throughout my life, in the last, especially the last 20 years or so, where he just shows up in such a way that if I do anything, I'll mess it up. I mean, honestly, where he's worried, there's such a fear of God in the room, and he's doing so many extraordinary things that that all, all I want to do is just stand back and watch and 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 celebrate this one who is so kind and so generous. So back to this nature of the kingdom. He teaches us about his world through, through natural things. In fact, let's go to John chapter 3, and I want to take you through a, a series of scriptures, uh, and we'll start with John 3. John chapter 3. Do you guys all have electronic versions of the Bible? Because I, I, I don't hear pages turning, so I'm, I, I, keep, I keep threatening to have somebody make an app that has the sound of pages turning when they turn on their, their uh, Bible app. So. John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. By the way, I, I've been trying to make a, a note in my Bible every time I see doing and teaching or word and action in the same phrase. Um, the opening of the book of Acts, uh, this account, O Theophilus, is of, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Anytime you see those two phrases, because in Western culture, we exalt thought and ideas so much that we don't always require doing. And you can go to, perhaps go to a business school, get a business degree and never been taught by anyone who owned a business because we elevate concept, thought, principle above experience. And idea, is thought, concept is supposed to lead to experience. It's supposed to lead to encounter. And people say, well, brother, if you emphasize experience, you're open to deception. And I say, if you have no experience, you're already deceived. <laughs> the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy. Two of those three realities are felt realities, peace and joy. That was a good point, Bill. <laughs> don't quit. Just don't quit. All right. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's an interesting statement. Being born again gives you the capacity to see. 
Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that's natural birth. That which is born of spirit is spirit, that's being born again. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from, where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know, testify what we have seen, and yet you do not receive our witness. Let's stop right there. Jesus interestingly uses two natural realities to give understanding to this genuinely hungry Pharisee. I love the fact that he came to Jesus at night and Jesus wasn't offended. He wasn't offended by the person who tried to sneak to him. Thank you. <laughs> you and me, come on. Somebody pay that man. That's a... <laughs> so Jesus uses two realities, natural things, a human birth to illustrate conversion, and then wind. The nature of wind, not knowing where it comes from, where it's going, that's the nature of a born again believer. And then he goes on, he says, we speak what we know, we testify what we have seen. He's not talking about him and the angels. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He is telling us, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen. God has a testimony. He's seen it quite a bit. He knows how the Holy Spirit was released from heaven into that upper room, creating tongues of fire, sounds of whirlwind. That that took fearful 120 people and made them world changers. He, he saw how that happened. He, he released on that highway of heaven, if you will, to invade these hearts, to take people who were fearful and weak into bold testifiers of grace. He has, he has all the stories. And yet he says, nobody will receive my, our witness. And then he goes on to the verse that I really want to talk to you about for a few minutes before we move deeper into the subject. It's in verse 12. He says, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? It's an important verse. If I tell you earthly things and you don't believe, how can I tell you he heavenly things? In other words, you don't have, if you don't have understanding of the kingdom as it parallels earthly realities, then you have no platform upon which I can build higher things. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, let me illustrate it this way. There, there are levels and dimensions of truth. He said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. One reality was greater than the other. But when you become a friend of God, and you don't become a friend by singing the song. I like the song, but that's not what makes you a friend. Friendship is developed over time. It's illustrated in obedience. When you become a friend of God, you don't stop becoming a servant of God. Servanthood is like the setting on a ring. Friendship is the diamond, it holds it in place. You don't get rid of one, an inferior, uh, inferior is not the right word, but I'll use it anyway. You don't get rid of inferior reality because you now have a greater. Sowing and reaping is a great way to learn biblical finance, but it's not the ultimate. The law of blessing is greater. Sowing and reaping is how we start, but he then begins to teach. This is when we get what we, according to what we've done. Law of blessing is according to what he's done. But he puts it in a context where we continue to learn sacrificial living and giving. 
So he, what he's trying to do, he's trying to give us, he's trying to lay a strong foundation for us so that, he, so that we are positioned to see what his world looks like. Why? Because I have the responsibility, I have been given the authority to bind on earth what has been bound there. We do that fairly good because we're familiar with the, the one who kills, steals, and destroys. We, we know that addiction doesn't belong up there. We know poverty uh, doesn't exist up there. We know cancer and disease doesn't exist in heaven. We know all that stuff. So when we come up against that, we know to, that we bind according to the contract that's being given to us. I, we hold you to the contract that says, I have authority over you. And so it's a binding contract, but we don't always know what to lose because of the lack of heavenly experience. You don't get it out of a book. You get it out of a journey. We're familiar with this world, with what's broken, so the binding part we do okay with. But when you bind something, you have to replace it with something. Jesus taught us that, the house that is clean and swept. And if it's not replaced with something, the enemy comes back seven times worse. And so sometimes we create perpetual difficulties in life because we haven't learned yet how to replace what we've removed with heavenly realities. <clears throat> so he says, he says, if I talk to you about earthly things, you don't get it. How can I talk to you about heavenly things? Well, what were the earthly things? Natural birth and wind. So I, I just revealed the nature of my kingdom to you with earthly things. And if, if you're still bewildered on how nature illustrates the kingdom, then I don't have a platform upon which to build a greater revelation of the nature of his world that works independent of natural laws. Verse 13, no one has ascended, I love this verse so much, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, my translation has this phrase, that is the son of man who is in heaven. Let's read it again. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. All right, this is before the death of Christ before the resurrection, before the ascension, before he is glorified. He is standing on planet earth as entirely God, but as the son of man. And he says to his guys, nobody has ascended except for he who descended. No one has ascended into what? Into heavenly realities. See, Paul found language for it later. He said, we are seated in heavenly places. Unfortunately, we've reduced it to a doctrine and it's often void of experience. It's an invitation. Come up higher. In the glory, you're not the performer. You're the clay that's being molded. I plan to. <laughs> so he says, no one has ascended except, one exception, only one, for he who descended, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Where was he standing? On planet earth. And he says, I'm in heaven now. See, he, he actually illustrated the citizenship of two worlds. He actually illustrated what it was to be seated, if you will, in heavenly places before that actually took place. He's illustrating, remember, he lived with the limitations of a human being to model for us something that could be followed. As God, he has access to everything. He can do whatever he wants but he chose to live with certain limitations. He said, the son of man can do nothing of himself. And I, I've looked it up, it actually means nothing. <laughs> the son of man can do nothing of himself. So he's, he's revealing to us 
how he chose to live with limitation. Um, Acts 10.38 was quoted, I don't remember, it was last night or this morning. Uh, but boy, these sessions have been so good. I've been just getting whacked over here. So I don't know if whacked is a good term in Texas, but in my world, it's a good word. It's a good word. I've been getting whacked. What was I going to say? I was going to say something so important. Acts 10.38. Thank you. I just started getting whacked talking about getting whacked. And that's, that's not always a good plan. All right. Acts 10.38. Um, I have a kind of a covenant thing with the Lord. Whenever I see 1038, um, I stop, whatever I'm doing. If I'm driving a car, I don't pull over, but I take that moment to turn my heart towards the Lord because of Acts 1038. It says, Jesus went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. It didn't say he brought healing to all who were oppressed of the devil because he was God. It says because God was with him. It's an emphasis. Is the other true? Absolutely, he's God but he chose to live in a way of absolute dependence. Why? To illustrate what was available and possible for everyone who followed him. So when he tells me nobody has ascended to heaven except he who descended, that is the son of man who is in heaven, then I learn that's why everything worked so well for him. Yes, he did only what he saw the Father do. Yes, he did only what he, he, he saw the Father do. He said only what he heard the Father say. Yes, he modeled that perfectly, but he was living from the unseen realities of God's absolute perfect dominion towards an inferior world that was needing a king like Jesus. And so he lived that way. He was illustrating, demonstrating this reality. And so he's wanting uh, badly to reveal these things to his own disciples. And so he says in John 16, he says, I have so many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. Bear is a weight-carrying capacity word. See, when God reveals stuff to us, he's, 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 not, just, uh, he's not just tickling our, our intellectual curiosity. He's, he's actually releasing the reality of another world over us. And there's, there's this weight-carrying capacity that we have. And he doesn't want to put over, on my shoulders above what I am able to carry. When there's a fracture in the foundation, the weightiness increases the size of the break, the crack. But for the person who's living honestly, uprightly, not in our own righteousness, but entirely in his, living uprightly, the weightiness of glory establishes it doesn't break. And so he says, I have so many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. You just don't you don't have the weight carrying capacity. So he's got so many things on his mind that he wanted to release over his people. And he said, but I can't. He says, but the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to tell you. So the point is, there's more. The point is, is, he already warned us, there's more. Not in addition to scripture, but have you had this happen where you read something you've read a hundred times and all of a sudden you see it differently because there's more. I personally think we're going to be studying this Bible throughout all of eternity and never exhaust the depth of what was accomplished and said. So here we have this amazing uh, introduction, if you will, to what it means to be born again. It means you, it means you enter into another kingdom and you start seeing things from a different perspective. And in this kingdom, it's, it's amazing. It's a narrow road into the kingdom, but it's a very broad road once you're inside. It's a straight and narrow road. There's only one door, it's Christ Jesus. But in the kingdom, it's bigger than the outside of the kingdom. And so Jesus is trying to draw his disciples into a place where he can build upon them an understanding of something far greater. Because if you see the reality of that world, you'll never fall for the deception of this one. You, you never get tricked into embracing the inferior over the superior reality of God's world. Go to chapter four of the Gospel of John.
I personally think the, the greatest revelation about worship in the Bible is in John 4. It's this conversation that he has with a woman at the well, and he, and he says to her, <clears throat> true worship is in spirit and in truth. It's in partnership with the Holy Spirit, and truth means nothing hidden. It's absolute, complete, continuous abandonment to who he is. Realizing he is the perfect father who already sees everything. Did you know there's only one thing more important than knowing God? I love just waiting. <laughs> Causing people to live in question of pain. <laughs> there's only one thing more important than God, knowing God, and that's God knowing you. He said, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. What does that take? Just its openness. I worship in spirit and truth. All that I am, I present to you again. This great revelation on worship is not what I want to talk about today, but it is followed by what I consider to be the greatest revelation on evangelism. I don't think it's an accident. I think evangelism in its purest form is an overflow of worship. Look at this verse with me. He says, verse 35, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, they are already white for harvest. If you belong to a church that supports missionaries around the world or has evangelistic crusades or anything, this verse is probably used quite often in most all of our churches, as it should be. It's a profound, wonderful, wonderful verse to just kind of get us back into place to realize uh, the harvest is ripe and ready. But let's think through the verse for a minute. Jesus said, you say it takes four months. Now, why would people say that? Because that's how long it takes. What is he doing? He's acknowledging a natural reality. Are you with me? He's acknowledging <clears throat> you have restricted. See, now he's building in them. You have restricted your understanding to the way I work and to the nature of my world. You've now restricted to your level of understanding of creation. But I say to you, look on the fields, they are already white and the harvest. <laughs> here's, the, here's the astonishing thing. I, may, you're probably, you probably have it all together, and this is just confession time for me. <clears throat> I know people that seem to be pretty far away from God, and they're not ready to receive Jesus today. Maybe in a month, maybe after 30 days of fasting, maybe 30 years of fasting, I don't know. Maybe then they would finally be open to the gospel. But Jesus said, the fields are white and ready for harvest now. Why? Because the greater the anointing, the greater the anointing, the bigger the impact for harvest. Let, let me illustrate. <clears throat> you remember the story of the man of the Gadarenes? It's one of my, one of my favorite stories. Jesus and the disciples, they're in a boat, another storm. I, I don't know about you, I'm thinking of buying a horse. And, <laughs> riding around the lake. There seems to be a lot of problems in that lake there. So, <clears throat> so they're, uh, they're crossing the sea. They finally make it to shore again. It's one of those miracle journeys, you know. <clears throat> they get to the other side and they crawl out. I, I don't know what they're doing. I'm, I'm kissing the earth. You know, I'm just glad we made it through that life-threatening storm again. <clears throat> and I lift up my eyes and here it comes. A man that is so demonized, his demons are possessed. <laughs> this, this guy has issues. He has a life subscription to issues. <clears throat> and he comes running at Jesus, and you can just hear Peter and John go, you take him low, I'll take him high. You know, they're, they're going to protect the master. <clears throat> and he, he almost doesn't look human because he's just, he's, he's so, so tormented. He tears clothes, rips uh, chains, he, he's, he just can't be bound. He's just, you know, who knows how many demons he had. I, we just know that 
when Jesus sent them into the pigs, 2,000 pigs killed themselves, <clears throat> deviled ham. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, it's bad. <laughs> Their whole economy went belly up. <laughs> Anyway, this guy comes to Jesus, and he falls at Jesus' feet, and the Bible says he begins to worship him. Let's just assume he's got 2,000 demons in him. He falls at Jesus' feet and starts to worship him. If 2,000 demons can't keep one person from worshiping Jesus, what is the church's excuse? falls at Jesus' feet and begins to worship him. Jesus brings him into his one-step program. <laughs> out of darkness, into his marvelous light. Now, if it takes you 12 or 100, I don't care. Let's just use all of them to get him free. But the greater the anointing, the fewer the steps. See, the problem is, if I don't see the fields as white under harvest the way he sees, what does he say? He says, look up and look on the fields. See the fields from my perspective, otherwise you'll see the obstacles, you won't see the readiness. Revelation leads to encounter, so if I truly see that the fields are entirely white under harvest, I've seen people so bound you would think they, they, they would not be saved ever. And somebody comes with that word of knowledge. Somebody comes with that prophetic word. Somebody comes with that power encounter. And all of a sudden, the person you thought that was so far away from God is maybe the closest guy in the room. Because in a moment of time, he's taken from outer darkness into light. It's the, it's the way you think. It's the way you see. It's not mind over matter. It's, it's seeing from his perspective. It's, and then seeing it and then pursuing the anointing that'll back it. Yes. It's pursuing earnestly the spiritual gifts that you said were available to me. <clears throat> and so Jesus brings him into his one-step program. <clears throat> and, uh, and then one of the funniest verses in the Bible, <clears throat> it says, the city all came and they saw him clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. <laughs> is that weird or what? As long as a guy is running around naked, eating our cats and dogs, breaking chains, doing the weird stuff, well, that's just the way he is. His father was the same way. <clears throat> as soon as he gets free, it's that weird church in town. You know, it's that, it's that cult. It's funny to me, the power of God can be missing from the church so long that when God finally shows up, people think it's the devil. So he's clothed and in his right mind, and the city comes, and they are now terrified of this Jesus. Now, imagine being one of the disciples. <clears throat> you barely make it through a storm. <laughs> you get to the shore, you get attacked, by half animal, half man, the demoniac. And it looks like that's turning out fine, and then the city comes and chases you out of town. How does your missions letter read as you try to raise support? We, we just landed in a new area to bring the gospel. Uh, one guy, we, we think he's saved, but Jesus won't let him travel with us, so I'm not sure. It's funny, because the, the guy, the guy is, the, the city is driving Jesus and the disciples out of town. You can see this guy running with Jesus. I'm with you. And Jesus says, you can't come. Now, I don't know about you. Uh, the way I think is, if I'm one of the disciples, I'm thinking, you know, if there was ever an exception, <laughs> we should perhaps allow this guy to hang out for at least a month or so to make sure he got all of his baggage removed. 
You know, let's be honest. If this guy comes to most of our churches and he makes it down the altar call or receives Christ, it's going to be five years spiritually muscle-bound before we'll let him be an usher or a, a director in the parking lot. Not you, but them other guys. So this guy's running along with Jesus, and Jesus says, you can't come. Go back and tell them all the great things I've done for you. Well, that looks good in print. What are all the things (laughs) that God has done for him? Uh, I'm the the naked guy. Uh, You notice I I have clothes. I enjoy having clothes on now. That's that's, uh, that's, that's a great difference. Uh, Sorry about your cats and dogs. that, that was done in poor taste. <clears throat> I mean, let's be honest, he doesn't have, you know, he's been hanging out with Jesus for, what, an hour? He, he doesn't have a great arsenal of sermons. He just is transformation. He is transformation. He's, <clears throat> he's not going back with points to debate with the theologians. He is going back with a transformed life. And the amazing thing about this story is the next time Jesus goes to this part of the world, it says every person from every village came to hear him speak. Every person. Why? Because of the authentic testimony of one transformed person. Jesus took this recent convert and made him the president of the Jesus Christ Evangelistic Association in that region. There was no vice president. He was it. But see, every time we have something authentic that's happened in our life. We've been positioned not only in a place of great authority, but we've been positioned to impart it. We carry it. We carry it. It's, it's, it's not hocus pocus here. You can have it. It's, it's that I, we carry stuff in God. We carry the spirit of breakthrough in specific areas. Some of you have unusual grace on your life for family life and for raising children and the way you communicate as a family is so extraordinary and it's so natural to you it's it's become such a a rich part of your life and your heritage that you don't even know how extraordinary it is yet people feed from that authority that you have they feed from that example constantly in matthew 5 jesus said you're the salt of the earth You're the light of the world. I know that in Bible days, salt was used to preserve meat, and of course, light exposes. And for 40 some years, about 40 years of ministry, I've been in for 47, but for about 40 of those years, I I taught that light exposed and salt preserved. And it's a secondary truth, it is real. It's just not what Jesus addressed. He said, You're the salt of the earth. If if the salt loses its flavor, flavor. We're actually supposed to add flavor to our communities. You You don't take the salt shaker, unscrew the top, and pour the whole salt shaker in the corner of the plate. You sprinkle it evenly over the meal. We're supposed to be sprinkled evenly over the meal to add the flavor of the king and his kingdom into every aspect and part of society that the musical grace upon certain cities should be enhanced because of the flavor of the people of God, the political world, the business world, the educational system. People become transformed from the inside because it also says the kingdom is like leaven and once leaven is worked in the dough, you can't pull it out. And so Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. But then he went on to say, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. When is a city seen for its light? It's at night. 
is people that are traveling, perhaps, and they're, they're needing refuge, they're needing shelter, they're needing food, they're needing companionship, community. They're not always drawn to us because of the desire for eternal life. They don't all have that value system. They may just want a healthy family. They, they may just want to have teenage kids that actually like them. <clears throat> and, and they see that yours do, and, and they're, they're stunned by it. See, sometimes people come to that city set on the hill. So there's two parts of the gospel that are equally important. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. The go is important. But this is the come of the gospel that we would become something, not in our church service, but in our life as citizens of communities. We would become something that people would come to. You go to a garden to pick vegetables. You go to a tree to pick fruit. You go to a stream to draw water. We're to become something that people would come to. <clears throat> and sometimes it's, it's that person that has lost their way and they're in the valley and they look up on the hill and there's a city all lit up and they're, they're hoping that they can find safety there. Maybe they're hoping for a friend. But they're drawn because of the light, the reality of another world that shines brightly in and through you. Some of you will have impact on people because your business didn't suffer the way others around you did during this virus. And it's not so that we can somehow boast on our gifts or, forgive me, but even our favorites, it's about, it's about revealing a person. It's about revealing a person. And some, some will be drawn to you simply because they say, how, how is it? We have the same business. Yours is thriving. Mine isn't. And how, how did you do that? They're, they're drawn to this city, if you will, the city of the redeemed, simply because they have an inbuilt desire to be successful in what God has called them to do, even though they don't acknowledge him as God. It's a God-given desire. So I believe the Lord is raising up people that know how to, what the Bible calls, reign in life. I'm sure that would be a familiar term in, in this tribe. It's fun, fun to be in this tribe today. Fun to be in this tribe. Randy Clark, my dear friend Randy Clark says it best. He says, there's a lot of streams. He, he says, every stream thinks they're the river. <laughs> we all get to contribute. It's such an honor to be here with you. So I would expect this to be common knowledge here, but just in case it isn't, reigning in life is what we were assigned to do, not reign over people. Reign in life. It's money doesn't control me, I control it. Relationships don't manipulate and control me, I, I manage relationships. Everything is done under the glory of God. <clears throat> The word proverb, of course, for proverbs for wisdom, actually comes from a word that means to reign or to rule. And so to understand, uh, Brian Simmons of the Passion Translation, now we're talking about this, and I, he made a comment that I, I think is so profound. He said, to really understand wisdom, wisdom is the access to reigning in life. It means that things work for you simply because you see from a different perspective, and in doing so, you become the city on the hill that somebody is drawn to because they are drawn to the light of God on your life. They don't know what it is. They may not know what to call it. They may not want to repent of their sin, but they're drawn to something in your life that they know they need. Let me, let me, end, with, let me end with this thought. We oftentimes answer questions that people aren't asking. <laughs> Often. <laughs> and the justification is, is these are questions they should be asking. And that's true too. 
you remember Saul before he became king? He, uh, he was the, the young man and his dad lost his donkeys. And he sent his son with his servant out to go find the donkeys. I forget how long they were gone, two or three days, I guess. And, and after looking all over the place for these <clears throat> donkeys, uh, Saul says to his servant, he says, we need to head home. He said, my, my dad's going to be more worried about us than the donkeys. And his servant says, oh, let's go over to this city over here. There's a prophet there named Samuel. He knows everything. Let's see if he knows where the donkeys are. <clears throat> so here, here comes Saul and his assistant. And they're walking towards Samuel. Samuel says, your donkeys have been found. <laughs> Come back tomorrow morning, and I'll tell you all that's in your heart. He come back, comes back the next day, and Samuel starts prophesying over him about becoming king. What's the point? Is he answered the question he had so he could be positioned to answer the questions he should have had. What's the purpose for my life? Why don't you stand? One of the major quests, <clears throat> pursuits of my life and for, for a long, long time has been concerning this issue of wisdom. <clears throat> and I know it wasn't the primary subject today at all, but I, I ended there, so that's where I want to pray. <clears throat> Paul prayed in Ephesians 1 that God would give to that group of people a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. Wisdom. Did you know that in the book of uh, Exodus, it records the first person in the Bible filled with the Holy Spirit? First person in Exodus. It said he was filled with the Spirit for the purpose of wisdom and understanding and for creative works in metal and wood, stone. Wisdom. The first demonstration of being filled with the Spirit in the Bible is wisdom. Now, when God reveals something, and then He reveals something greater, what did we say earlier? It never abolishes the previous. What does it do? It uses the previous as the context in which to reveal the new. Yes? Lie to me if you have to. Yes? All right. <laughs> So the power of God, the fullness of the Spirit is seen in wisdom. New Testament, the power of God is seen, the baptism, the filling of the Holy Spirit is seen in power. It was always meant to be that wisdom and power would work in absolute cooperation. Wisdom deals with the immediate conflict, excuse me, power deals with the immediate conflict, wisdom lit deals long term. Wisdom worked into culture, into the way we do life, into our family lines, our, our heritage. Wisdom works into family life, creates a momentum for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. I saw a, I saw a document, I'm, I, I don't have a habit of watching documentaries. I'd rather have bombs blow up and fast cars and, you know, beautiful scenery. Just, that's, that's what I prefer. But I watched a documentary, mostly because my wife turned it on. It's like in heaven. God says, I want all the women to meet with St. Peter, all the men. I want you to make two lines, one for those who have been the heads of their household and those who were dominated by their wives, two separate lines. And the guys that were dominated by their wives, and the line was 100 miles long, and there's only one guy in the other line. And he says, you guys should be ashamed of yourself. You should have learned from this man. And he turns to him and he says, how is it that you are the only one standing in this line? And he said, my wife told me to stand here. <laughs> I don't even remember what I was telling you now. I've, I've... <laughs> Documentary, thank you. You're a nice guy. I need help. I need to get to be rescued over and over again. This documentary showed these monarch butterflies 
I understand this, I've researched it since then, there's like 300 million of them in Mexico. They migrate from Mexico to Canada. A lot of people knew that. What I didn't know was it takes four generations to get there. Four generations. Multi-generational migration. We are setting a course for the demonstration of wisdom and power that will enable our children and our grandchildren to take it where we did not have time to go. <clears throat> all right, so let's pray. I still have all kinds of time, so I'm just letting you know I'm, I'm letting the circulation back into your body because you've been sitting in those chairs for so long. All right. So, Father, we do, we do look for, to you. We look to you. And I ask, according to Ephesians 1, 17, you to release the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, that you would release that over us at a dimension, a level that is fresh, that is new, that actually draws us into encounters with you. We, we want to see you. It's your heart that moves us. Your countenance just wrecks us for anything else. So I'm asking, let us see the delight of your face. You commanded us to seek your face. So we set our heart like flint on the face of the Lord. Lord God, reveal to us this perfect and complete countenance of a loving Father that nothing else would ever satisfy. Build in us a lifestyle of wisdom that can be imparted into multiple generations. We do pray that together we would be a part of a multi-generational migration, that which takes us into realities of the kingdom that have never been seen before. And we pray this, that the name of Jesus would be held in highest honor. Everybody said, amen. Bless you, bless you, bless you.